integration. So integration started off with an idea of finding areas underneath curves. So this is going to be a really cool application because up till now, you've got certain areas you can find out. There is a rectangle. You know a formula for the rectangle. But if we would take If we take a parabola, all of a sudden the area underneath the parabola is a little bit difficult to calculate because it's curved. But this unit, we're going to be able to find out how to do that. Now, the interesting thing about integration is the ideas for integration, which now typically everybody learns integration after derivatives. Derivatives is what you learn first, and if you remember at the beginning of our derivatives unit, they said that dates back to Leibniz and Newton around the 1700s, 1800s is the timeline. But integrals go way back to Archimedes. Archimedes was already figuring this out a lot earlier than derivatives. And yet when we learn things, we learn it the other way. We learn derivatives first and then integration afterwards. What Archimedes did is he said, I know what a rectangle is. I can figure out the area of a rectangle. So if I've got a curved surface here, what happens if I just use a bunch of little rectangles to estimate that? Will it be close? Yes. If I make my rectangle smaller, I get closer. And if I keep making them smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, I can get as close as I want to finding that area, yeah, like a limit. And so he had the idea, okay, already. Keep going further and further. He called it the method of exhaustion because adding up a billion rectangles is tiring. And, if you get and then once you do that, he says, well, you could split them all in half and do it again. And so it's exhausting because you're doing it smaller and smaller, but you get closer and closer. Yeah, Archimedes, 300 BC, no computers. That's well, BC before computers. Um, <laughs> this is a long time ago. So we're going to start off with looking at some stuff with anti-differentiation. It's the reverse process of differentiation. And so this is why it's taught after derivatives because after the fact of finding these areas under curves, a connection was made between derivatives and integrals that they're just a reverse process of each other. So the antiderivative or the integral is finding out what the original function would have been. So if you had f prime of x to equal 2x, what would the original function have been? it would have been x squared. Is that the only function it could have been? No, x squared plus What's our number? 15? Yeah. It could have been x squared plus 15. It could have just been x squared. X squared minus 15. Could have been x squared minus 15. It could be x squared plus anything. So we're going to start saying x squared plus c, where it could be anything. Now c is a number, any number, a constant. So here we have our x squared graph and the derivative would be 2x. We're going to find out later that that 2x is going to relate to the areas under the curve but we'll do that later, right? And this is what we were talking about. It could have been plus 15. It could have been minus 15. So we write plus c to show all the different infinite possibilities. Because the derivative of any constant is 0, then working backwards, we have to show that there was more than one possibility. So we do this by doing a plus c.
and saying that c could be any real number. And then if we write all of those ones down, we call that an indefinite integral. We're not a specific one. It could be all of those, so we have that plus c. That is called the indefinite integral. There's our integral signed. What is inside is called the integrand. And the dx part tells you what you're integrating with respect to. Right? So we are not going to do any kind of implicit in definite integration stuff. I'm not sure that's a thing. But we're, the dx is telling us what we're integrating with respect to. So sometimes it says, if this was my derivative, then here's my original function, and then I have to write the plus c. OK. When we did our power rule, you guys are really good at the power rule already. If you had x to the 5 and you were doing the derivative, what did we do? We get 5x to the 4. We could say that we multiplied the function by the exponent, because this is our derivative, right? I'll write it f prime of x to keep the notation the same f prime of x is 5x to the 4. And if we would write out the process of what we did, is we brought the 5 out in front. In other words, we multiplied our function by the exponent. And then we subtracted 1 from the exponent. So we get 5x to the 4. Now, we had 5x to the 4 before, if we would, you go back to your notes, I think this is the exact same example I had in chapter 2. You stole it. I stole it. I should have made reference here in a footnote, taken from our notes from chapter 2. But you had, you had dy dx. Yeah. If you steal, I don't know, if you steal from yourself, if you take $5 from one pocket, put it in the other pocket, you're like, oh, my God. I don't know if that helps. OK. But we figured out that this was x to the 5 plus c. And this one was really easy because it was really obvious what it was. And another one that we had from before was a little bit harder, 12x squared. But you guys were able to do it no problem. Okay. And then it could be plus c, where c is any real number. No problem working backwards. But what happens if we had numbers that weren't so nice? Could you work backwards just as easily? Like if I told you, let's do, like, this was mental math. You were able, able to do that almost directly? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's do some mental math. Right? What, can, what, what is it equal to? Y equals? I, I don't want it. I want it simplified, please. Come on. A little bit faster. What's, that's the derivative. What was the original function? Eight third. Well, we don't know. That's what you want to find. The derivative, nice try. What was the original function? Yeah, just sneak it in there. So you're saying it's 56 over 36 x to the 12 over 7 plus c. You're not sure? Is that a final answer? Does it work? That is correct. Wasn't, it wasn't as easy to mental math it when we had our fractions and other things involved. So what did you start to do? OK? What did you? We added 1 to the exponent and divided by what you had 
here because that would go out in front. So in other words, you took the steps that we did naturally, step one, step two, when you did your derivative, and you undid them. So instead of subtracting one from the exponent, you add one to the exponent. And instead of multiplying the number in front, you divide by whatever our new exponent is in order to figure that out. And then we have to add the constant c because we're working backwards. Well, let's, let's look at that awful example I just made with these steps in mind. So we had started with dy dx equals, what did I have, 3 eighths? Eight thirds, oh, look at that, simple fix. Eight thirds, x to the, what did I have, 5 sevenths. Maybe. Eight-thirds x to the five-sevenths. So what it's saying is what you're going to do is you're going to add one to the exponent, which is going to make this 12 over 7. And then the number in front, you're going to have to divide by your new exponent. Simplifying this, and then of course plus c, Simplifying this, fraction divided by a fraction, multiply by the reciprocal. The 7 times the 8 will give you the 56. The 3 times the 12 gives you 36, which is what we came up with. And of course, you could reduce that 56 over 36 to be? They both divide by 2. They both divide by 4. So you get 14 over 9. You're correct. Okay. So now, when we see our power rule, you're going to find that although you could do so many with mental math before, you're going to start doing this process of saying, I'll just add one to the exponent and divide, and maybe do it in two steps to simplify. Okay. So let's look at our original example, which was this. You're going to start doing this. You're going to start saying, I'm going to add 1 to the exponent and then divide by my new exponent. So you'd write it like this instead of writing the 4 and simplify it after. But it works out to the same thing. Plus C. So here's our general formula. All we're doing here. We highlight some things. We're adding 1 to the exponent, and we're dividing by our new exponent. And dx means the relationship to x, we're finding the x. Yes, so we're, we're finding the integral with respect to x. So the dx there is just part of the notation, but it does need to be there. Why can't n equal negative 1? Because it's equal to 0. Because then you would be dividing by 0. So that would be a problem. And any time there's a number in front, it's the same thing. So yeah. Well, we've done that already. You just have to work, think about it. Well, like that's x to negative 1. Right. You can't use this. You can't use this. It'd just be natural log of x. Yes. OK. So we've got a couple here for you guys to try. I'll give you a little bit of time for those four. The first one. Oh, and we probably should. You're going to have to put the plus C every time. I will give you the benefit of the doubt that you know that C can be any real number, so you won't have to define c as an element of the real numbers every time. Fair enough? OK. Second one. Yay. OK. Negatives are a little harder, because sometimes adding and subtracting with the negatives can be mistakes. Anybody write minus 4 by accident? No. 
The other thing that integration will do is we'll mix you up because, you want to go back to the last one for a second? We'll mix you up because now sometimes you're adding, sometimes you're subtracting because you'll have to do derivatives and integrals. Ready for the third one? Third one, have to do some preliminary work to change it. And then you have a fraction inside a fraction, so a little bit of simplification to do. You got it? Awesome. Well, that's fine. That's fine. Then put the 10 back in it. And then last one, ready? So again, we have to do some preliminary work here to change the x to the 3 sevenths, add 1 to the exponent. So you can say at the end of this year, one thing that calculus has really taught me is how to add or subtract 1, because we do it so often to anything, fractions in particular. Okay, so some more properties. Well, we knew that we could, if functions were adding and subtracting, we could take the derivatives of them separately. So when we integrate, the same thing happens. If you're integrating two things that are added or subtracted, you could integrate them separately. And so here, if we want to find the integral of this one, we could find the integral of x to the 5, which is just add 1, divide by that new exponent, and the integral of negative 3x, which will add 1, divide by that new exponent. And what's the integral of 2? 2? 2x. And then plus c. Now, if you integrated them all separately, they'd all separately have a plus c, plus c, plus c. But in the end, all those real numbers added together would just be some new plus c. No. If you, if you write plus c, I'll know you mean c is a real number. No, because when you're integrating, you, integrate. you could integrate any real number is going to be zero. I mean, when you're deriving, the derivative of any real number is going to be zero. So knowing this fact, sometimes we're going to get ones like this. And currently, we don't have a power rule for integration or a quotient rule for integration. So if we get something like this, we're going to have to change it into a form that we can integrate. We did this before in derivatives too, before we knew some of our derivative rules. So this is the same as the integral of x squared plus 4x minus 21. And anytime you're writing an integral, you always have to write the dx at the end. And this is going to equal, add 1 to the exponent and divide, add 1 to the exponent and divide, minus plus c. 
Now notice what I did there is what you're going to start to do. When we worked backwards from 4x before, you would have just thought in your head and said 2x squared. But now we just add one to the exponent and divide. It's a, we can simplify that to be 2x squared, but you're going to find you're going to do that process because it's just simple and works quickly. For writing that answer, well, but the problem is you can only factor it out of these ones because there's a number there. So it's not really that helpful partial factoring. So, I'd like you to try this one. Okay, so did you factor? Did you factor the first one and find out that it was, oh, nicely simplified the x minus 2's go away? And so now we just have the integral of x minus 4, which becomes x squared over 2 minus 4x plus c. So we have one property of integrals that it doesn't matter if you're adding or subtracting, you can integrate separately. Another factor or property of integrals is that if you are multiplying by a number, you can just pull that number out and integrate by itself first. And here's a great example of this. If we wanted to find the integral of 20 over x dx. Now sometimes that number doesn't need to be factored out because you can just deal with it, right? And in this case, the number one thing that people try to do is the following, which is wrong, okay? This is what my brain tells me I should do. Oh, I know how to factor these. I'm going to just make this x to the negative 1. I am going to add 1 to the exponent and divide by, oh my goodness. Stop it. You end up like that. No. Oh. Suddenly, suddenly an actual. Oh. Suddenly so this is bad, natural. right? So what do we have to do instead? This isn't working, but if I, instead, if I factor out the 20, if I bring the 20 out in front of my equation, it may be that you recognize 1 over x quicker than you recognize a 20 over x. Because we have something in chapter 2 that said the derivative of this is 1 over x. The derivative of natural log of x was 1 over x. So if you're working backwards, you'd say, hey, I recognize this, and so my derivative will be 20 natural log of x plus c. So that means we now know that 20 divided by 0 is natural log of x. <laughs> no, this is all bad. The red one that I said this is bad, this is wrong math. Well, Well, in a limit, with a limit, you're getting close to zero, but this process doesn't work here. Okay. The derivative is taking a limit as well. So we have our general result. We could do a couple easier ones. Now, this is, this is some interesting things that happen. Because integrals and derivatives are reverse processes of each other. 
So the question is, do they just cancel out? Almost. If I integral a derivative, is it just what I started with? Yes. And if I derivative an integral, is it just what I started with? There's the C, and the C makes a difference. So in this case, if we do the derivative of the inside, we get, whoops, we get the derivative of the inside would be 10x dx. And if you integrated this, you would get, well, add 1 to the exponent, divide by 2, plus C. So it does cancel out in this case, but we still have the plus C. However, if we do the process the other way, integrate first, then do the derivative, and I'll write all the steps here. So I'm going to integrate first. That means add 1 to the exponent, divide by our new power, and then do the derivative of this. Oh, and I would have plus C inside. And now when I take the derivative, the negative 2 would come out in front, cancel out with the negative 2 on the bottom, subtract 1 from the exponent, and the derivative of the plus c would be 0. So they do cancel each other out, but one time you get the plus c, the other time you do not. So when the, in this one where you integrate and then do the derivative, or you derivative first and then integrate, you would have a plus c in your final answer, right? This one you would need a plus c. But in this example, where you do the derivative last, there is no plus c. Well, it depends which order the question asks. Like, Integrate first, then do the derivative. There's, there's no plus c. Derivative first, then integrate. If you're integrating last, there will always be a plus c. Yeah. 